Okay, we should be live. So welcome everybody. And uh, this is our third meeting at DevFlix. Uh, today we, we have a pleasure to um, meet and learn from Victor. Uh, we'll be talking about the clean and pragmatic architecture. Uh, so thank you very much, Victor, for joining us and uh, sharing your knowledge uh, with us. Um, it will be mostly Q&A session, so if you have any question about the architecture, clean code, and so on, and any other question, because Victor is a very knowledgeable person, so uh, even if something goes beyond the architecture, uh, he for sure would like uh, would try to uh, answer your questions. The goal so, is to have uh, as many questions, indeed. So as many questions you have, just shoot them as soon as you're... Yeah, you got them. Yeah. Please. Definitely, definitely. But uh, before we start, and we are still uh, gathering, uh, uh, we have a, a sponsor for uh, for this uh, for this uh, Deflix series. So uh, it's Globo. Uh, so probably you know it. Uh, it's a company that's delivering the the, the food, uh, maybe for you as well. Uh, so let's uh, watch a one, one minute video, and after that we'll start the question. So we have a time to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just ordered today. Product placement. <laughs> so uh, during this one minute video, watch and uh, think about your question, and you can start um, uh, asking them uh, in the Q and A or chat uh, window at the top right corner. Okay. In I said, like, wow, this is the job I've been looking for. There are no two days that are the same. Like I'm always doing different things. Even though, you know, we have job descriptions, there are always things that come up. Lovo is growing so much, forces you to be on your toes always, to, to adapt very quickly, uh, uh, to change. For me, it's important to work in a company that is really promoting and pushing sustainable and social impact projects. It's been really amazing. Everybody, all my colleagues have been really helpful in getting me onboarded from the time I arrived. So yeah, I, I just love it here. The people in Globo are all amazing. I can definitely feel that people really care about each other, but also like the company and also the customers and riders and partners who are actually the inside of our uh, ecosystem. What I like the most about working here is that I have a voice and I've been growing and learning since day one. It's been amazing. I'm challenged every single day. I, I get to work with different cultures, with different people. I get to travel, which is amazing. At Global, we welcome top performers from diverse backgrounds that bring in new ideas and perspectives. Global will be the job of your life because you'll grow, have an impact, and work in a dynamic environment. Okay, uh, Victorine, to turn on your camera and mute microphone again. Okay, uh, sure. And I should share my screen, right? Sure. Yep. All right, <laughs> nice. Uh, uh, there are several uh, companies today that really changed the world. And in my opinion, Google Maps is one of them, Waze, Glovo, and perhaps several few others. I mean, like Revolut and stuff like that. Uh, like game changers. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Clean, pragmatic architecture. Another reminder, please shoot the questions the moment you have in the chat. I'll keep an eye on it. So the purpose today is to have as many questions from your side. Uh, you may have heard uh, me talking about these topics uh, previously. I don't know if you, uh, if you saw this talk before, but the goal is questions. So any kind of idea you have, just shoot at me. But to... Uh, generate as many questions as possible, I will. I do have some slides, but I am not keen on following them. So I can just stop the slides and debate on any topic, that, an interesting topic that arises. So just shoot the questions at any moment. Brief introduction, my name is Victor Enta. I've been coding Java since, I don't know, 15 years ago. Uh, and right now uh, I'm doing trainings for a living in different companies throughout the world. Uh, my topics are the typical Java stack, Spring Hibernate functional programming with Java, but uh, also stuff that doesn't have anything to do with the language in particular, like ar architecture, clean code. And today we have clean architecture, a combination of this, plus a keyword, pragmatic, which is, in my opinion, mandatory whenever you are talking about architecture. The first thing you need to care of is to uh, have a simple architecture. So I'm an extreme programmer, if you want to comment on that. Like, I'm, I like simplicity, 
very, very, very much. Unit testing, also, you can't have a reliable application. <laughs> Can you imagine how many unit tests Glovo has? <laughs> Just imagine. Right. Anyway, <clears throat> performance reactive secure coding. Speaker at different conferences and meetups like we are uh, gathered here today. January 10, oh my God, what a day. So uh, trainings at companies, but also open groups that you can join. Check out my website if you want to know more details. I also have some video courses recorded. They are pretty hardcore, pretty intense, not for juniors, for rather experienced people, they're recorded for you. But I also do uh, free stuff, most of which is part of my is on my community. So I have this beautiful community that I've grown to more than 3,000 people that I will invite you all to join. And I'm doing really, really, really cool stuff every, every, every month. Uh, for example, next thing that I'm planning to do in January, one of the interesting things is mob programming. If you've never tried mob programming, that might be a surprise for you. So in January, you will see four of us coding at the same code taking turns one after the other. So it's called more programming for people, Belgium, Romania, Germany, and Italy, all of us coding uh, on the same code base, continuing and challenging each other. It's an experiment to see how it goes. And I'm trying to do this stuff every month. So join that community if you want to stick close. And I will also have a YouTube channel. That's me. <clears throat> now, <laughs> clean architecture, clean pragmatic architecture. I roughly have three sections here. First, to talk about data structures that we work with, then how do we organize logic, and the last section will be about value objects. But again, I'm not keen about uh, 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 checking all the topics. The point is to have as many debates we can. But that's a very common scenario today that we're seeing. Imagine going to a restaurant and ordering a chicken <laughs> or using a glove to order a chicken from a store. And the next thing you know, you receive this chicken. Uh, what do you feel? You are the customer, you are the client. You were, you probably had a different opinion about what the chicken should look, right? Probably you wanted some food containing chicken, but they shipped you a chicken in the vision of the chicken farm, right? Uh, that's a data transfer object received over, over the network from the chicken microservice, right? From the chicken farm microservice. But that's not what you want to work with if, within your core logic. The structure, that you want to use in your complex logic is the one is one structure that uh, um, you control is a domain object. It's an object from your own uh, uh, from your, your own universe. Typically, something which is immutable, something which is small. So it, the first thing to start with is data transfer objects are evil. I'm telling this especially in the context of microservices in which we stumble upon structures coming from other systems all the time. So let's see why data transfer objects can, uh, can be bad, in what ways. Most of the time, DTLs are bloated, have more fields than you really need, have, I don't know, 20 fields plus three substructures in a list, and the only concern, you only want to read three of, or five fields. Right? So you want focused, cohesive, small data structures. You don't want the whole stuff data structure. Okay, so we want focused objects that don't contain any extra field. Imagine looking at the function, taking an object containing 24 fields or 12 fields. How do you feel? Next question is, what the heck is it using from those 12 fields? If you would instead pass an object with three or four fields, it would be much easier to, to follow the idea of the code, of course. DTOs are typically made flat. What do I mean by that? A bag of fields, and you will find very often street name, street address, street city, street zip, street, 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 structures, fields, which would otherwise be placed in a rich domain object. I don't want street name, street number, street address, street city. I want an object called street address with fields inside. A rich, deep model, not a flat one. But for backwards compatibility, most of the time, the APIs that we use do give us <clears throat> structures which tend to be flat, much more flat than the one that we will create ourselves. Right? Then again, they have a different perspective. <laughs> I remember the chicken. So in the minds of a chicken farm, that was the perfect chicken, but it's not, that's not, not what I want. And you will see here a word coming from domain-driven design. They understand a different thing from what a chicken means. Right? In our, on our end, on our system, we want data structures that are tailored for our problem. Right, a chicken dish, not a chicken, <laughs> physical chicken. So we have a different understanding. 
Right? Uh, DTOs bring that external mindset inside your application. The, and this can do very subtle harm on the long term, especially when working with microservices. Uh, uh, concepts, diverging concepts might creep in uh, applications that use DTOs freely inside their domain. Fix the design. You don't usually can. You can't usually change the structure of a DTO you receive. That's usually part of a public API or something, a contract, which is depended upon by others. So you can't. You don't. You don't have any control of that. On other. On other. On the other end, we would like uh, full control on the data structures that we use to build our more complex logic. So we want full control of the structures in our logic. Then mutable. DTOs, most of the time, we generate them from a need, from a from a Swagger definition, open API to whatever you or and when they when we generate them, they always have getters and setters. It's very rare that I see today uh, um, the DTOs which are immutable. Most of the time they have getters and setters. On the, or, um, when we on the other side, on the other uh, <clears throat> we want in our domain. Immutable objects, immutable objects which are safer to use, which are which which are much easier to track changes in, uh, thread safe, and all the good stuff that functional programming gives us. So, so mutable versus immutable, and also of course, of course, DTOs they don't usually carry any constraints; they just have getters and setters. Whereas we, especially if we go for a rich domain object model like in domain-driven design, we will want to have our models guarding their own cons consistency, internal consistency, like uh, constructors checking fields for nulls or, 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 or different guard conditions, setters, smart setters checking the transitions in state and validating the model on the fly. Right? And very important, DTOs also can change in time. Change in time, not because we want, because they want the API changes, of course, version two. Or on the other hand, we want full control of our structures. We don't want the, the fundamental, the basis of our, of our logic to just move away. We don't want the structures just, just blow up. We want stable data structures to build our logic on. That's why we want to, 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 to be uh, wary of data structures, foreign data structures trying to enter our application. So if you if you if I were to summarize all of that study in a single idea, the point is never to implement complex logic on data structures which are not yours to control entirely. It's imprudent, it's it's risky to do that. And that's that comes with some trade-offs already. What is complex? Would I implement would I make sure that I have a different set of objects? Uh, that I build my lo that I build my logic on a different set of objects every single time? Not necessarily. Only if I have sufficient complexity. Only if I have creepy business rules, complicated uh, logic to implement. If I only have to enrich some data from here to there, I don't need a domain model of my own. I can just move the data in, data out without ever having my own internal structure. But the internal structure becomes mandatory whenever you start implementing complex stuff, right? And again, another question, very cool question today. What do you consider to be foreign? of an application. And that's a re very complicated question. And the, the typical uh, answer to this question is anything which is not developed by uh, anything which is outside of the current system. So if you have some data structures which are designed, which are part of the API of another system, of another deployment artifact, that could be regarded as a foreign thing. But then you might be in the case of a nano service. You might be building super tiny microservices. For example, imagine a case in which five developers are maintaining 20 nano services. I've, I've, I, have, I, have, I have clients like this. Uh, there are five or seven uh, developers maintaining 20 microservices. And I wonder, how, how big are those microservices? Uh, they're super tiny. I mean, 2,000 2, lines, 5,000 lines, 1,000, super tiny. If you have this cluster of developers maintaining a shared set of microservices, then these could be part of the same bounded context. And here we are again with this, with this word, bounded context. When you have a team taking care of some systems, you might consider those systems to be, let's say, friend, not, not friend, family. <laughs> so in other words, if, this, if one developer in here wants to add a field in a structure here and then replicate it and move the field to that other system, if the two are developed by the same shared team of developers, it might, I, I might agree that the DTO from here actually enters the core of system two. 
something which I otherwise completely discourage you to do. So DTOs can be shared if you have a shared team of developers uh, implementing together a set of microservices. Now, why? Because they share the same understanding about what a chicken means. They share the same goal. They are a shared team, technically speaking. This is dramatically different than what happens when you consume an API coming exposed to you by a different team with different budgets, different deadlines, different management. That's a completely different story. You definitely don't want a data structure from their API entering and corrupting your internal uh, domain, your, your core logic. Super, super tricky this one. I'm not a big fan of microservices, but still, if you are playing this game, be aware of this trick, okay? But as a rule of thumb, anything which is generally, anything which is outside of your system is not yours, it's foreign. And it should be regarded with, not despise, but be very careful what you build on the structures coming to you from outside. And on the same line, again, I'm telling you not to depend on structures coming from outside, but I'm, now I'm telling you not to expose your internal domain. So you create your own data structures on which you build your complex logic, okay? That, that domain entities, if you want to name them hibernate entities, okay, your entities, never expose them as JSON. It's obvious for most of us, but let me put it on slide ahead surprises, right? Because if you expose your, your entities freely as JSON, then your clients will become coupled to your internal structures of the entities. You won't be able to refactor freely the entities anymore, right? Yeah, indeed, Marcin, different release, uh, release cadence. If that happens, you're screwed because, yeah, yeah it's a madness. Uh, of course, there are tricks there also about backwards compatibility, non-breaking changes, time to live. I mean, uh, uh, um, how, how, what's the, the technical term for this? The uh, maximum allowed time for, for upgrade, right? Uh, it's not really in my scope, but let's, let's dive in a bit. Um, if you release on a, on a different cadence than a different team, Anything you, it comes from them, you need to be very, very, very wary about because it can change at the, at, at the worst possible moment for your deployment. Of course, if we are all playing nice, no one will just blow up their API on Tuesday and from Wednesday it's version two. There will be a time in which they will allow you to upgrade most of the time. Or if they release a new version of their API, they, sh they, sh they should be backwards compatible. It means that if there is an input field, they will accept you sending it null or absent. If, uh, on the other hand, they expose more data, they won't break the existing data. They will expose additional data. This takes a completely different flavor if you employ GraphQL. Have you ever heard of GraphQL? It's really changing the game in some clients of mine. It's a, it's a, it's a, query language in which your client JavaScript or, or client application just uh, tells it it wants these two fields, the three fields and the response changes accordingly. So it technically allows you to expose different kind of uh, attributes and your clients to decide what they want from your, um, on their own will, right? So you could expose the old field and the new field and you can let them choose what they want. Of course, things get a bit more messy if you want to do a, a breaking change. But usually you will provide like three months to upgrade or six months to upgrade enough for the others to, if you all play nice. <laughs> it's complicated. I've seen dramatic cases like politics saying, like, okay, two weeks from now we will destroy the API. That's bad. <laughs> That's not a normal, uh, nice attitude for that. Okay. So coming back here, I was saying the never expose entities in your API. Out, out there in the wild, because that will couple your clients to your internals and you want freedom. You know, the most important part of domain-driven design, uh, one of the most important parts is, the, uh, is the, the, the habit of bringing the domain, the Java code, the, the code as close as possible to the real world, right? With continuously aggressive refactoring of your, dom of your domain. You can't do that if your API exposes your entities, right? In case there are very small changes between entities, domain objects, and drop, what do you think about automatic mapper tool like Dozer? Thank you. So again, uh, it comes in a couple of seconds. The couple, is, uh, it's a goal for us. Just a second, just a second, Paolo. It's a goal to the couple DTOs from domain models, right? Now, there is an exception. Before we continue, I want to point this out. I worked personally myself on a system which was just 
um, an integrator between the, go the French government and a large bank from France. My system that I was developing was, was, was offering data to other uh, informating, uh, inform information systems from the ecosystem. Our goal was to shield them from the miseries of integrating with the governmental system. Right? Our system, the entire system, was an adapter. Hmm? We didn't actually have a domain of our own. We were just con converting data. That's it. Hmm? With the exception of such degenerate, let's say, system, most of our of our of our applications do have their own domain, their own logic, for which it pays to decouple DTOs from domain model. But any any decoupling, as we all know, comes with a price, right? Comes with a price. So this decoupling comes with two, two problems. First, you need to create a DTO for every entity, as you say, and this is a bit, a bit strange if they are very, very similar. Plus, you get to write get set, get set, you know, that kind of code, get set, get, and this is frustrating for, for many of us. Now, we are very ingenious in nature, so we found ways to avoid each of those. First of all, creating more classes, we found ways to generate DTOs from YAML file using Swagger gen or uh, tools that generate DTOs based on some YAML or JSON, okay? Very rarely we craft DTOs anymore. We do that when you expose APIs to our own Angular or a React frontends. But if we expose services to other microservices, to other systems, it is becoming a common habit to create your contract in a Swagger or a YAML or op open API too, and then generate the artifacts on both consumer and producer side. Hmm? But then what do you do with the mapping? And you say, dozer. Okay. This, uh, automat th this mapping, and at the beginning of every system, you look at the entity, you look at the DTA, and you say, damn, they look very similar. It's stupid to just get set everything, right? So the first thing you do, you use automapper. Map struct or dozer, as you say. Now, these auto mappers have this we this 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 wonderful feature. If the field name in the entity matches the field name in the DTO, you don't have to do anything. It maps automatically the field from one side to another, which is perfect, problem solved. <laughs> ah. Every time you try to take shortcuts in life, at some point, you will suffer. Let me show you, let me tell you what I saw in some of my clients. I have this amazing opportunity to work with different companies every every week, basically, in average two or three per week. And I've seen things. <laughs> I've seen developers saying, let's keep them in sync. Let's keep the DTO and entities in sync. Why? Just to take advantage of the auto mapper, to, keep, to take advantage of the ability to copy paste fields automatically without writing any line of code the temptation to keep the two in sync. But quick reminder, why did we create the DTO in the first place? To decouple our API from our internal sacred domain model. So now we are keeping them in sync. Like, what the hell? We are fighting against ourselves. Why did we create the DTOs in the first place? So the point is, they must be allowed to diver diverge. I'm not against using an automapper tool, don't get me wrong, but be very careful about being tempted to keep them in sync. They are, they are supposed to diverge, okay? That's why you created the DTO different than the entities, right? If they don't diverge, you either don't have, don't have guts enough to, to crack deeper in, into your domain model as you learn it more and understand it better, or you just don't have sufficient changes in your application. Hmm? But in most medium and more complex applications, they will diverge. And at some point you will find a very hard, you will have a very hard time convincing the tool to do the complicated mapping you want from this phone number split in the area code to a simple string in DTO. And when that time comes, I would say drop, stop using the uh, auto mapper. So in my humble opinion, the auto mapper should be removed from the project after one year of development, should, be, should not be worthy of keeping uh, in one year since the starting of development, because by that year, the DTOs and entities will start diverging. Ah, it's very often the case from what I've, from the projects I led and I've, what I've seen, at some point, DTOs will start uh, being different, okay? So keep that in mind, use it, 
don't don't want to I don't want to just stop using it. Be very careful when it starts annoys you, an, annoying you, just throw it away, right? Manually get set, get set, get set. Right? <sighs> Again, don't implement complex logic on foreign data structures. F folks, shoot questions if you have. I see someone using generally DTO are bloated so that they can be reused. We don't want duplicated classes. DTOs are bloated. Uh, thank you. Uh, so that they can be reused. Um, you mean what? You mean creating like a DTO which can convey any information in the world? Like the SOA dream, service story in the dark architecture. They dream, they, they had that, that dream to create an enterprise wide set of objects that can be understood by all the systems in their ecosystem. That, that failed miserably. Uh, I'm not sure if, if that's what you mean. It can be reused. Or you might mean uh, using the same DTO to create, edit, and view an entity, uh, uh, something, like a user or a customer. The, the uh, customer DTO is sent to create the customer. The same DTO is sent to edit the customer. Let, let's, let's, let's investigate this a bit more. I, I think that's what you mean. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, if not, please help guide me. But um, I had this somewhere in some presentation. Just a second. The whole purpose is just the debate again. So just a couple of seconds to find the clean architecture uh, thing. That's it. Let's see. No, nah. Okay, let me handwrite it. It's very easy. Uh, imagine a customer DTO, okay, uh, which has an, uh, of course, a long ID, uh, uh, big L because sometimes it's null when you create it, it's null, right? Then just back to back to the chat, right? Then it has it has a name, a string name, and very interesting, it has a, a, a local date created app. Now, if these three things are in the same customer DTO, you can technically use this to create at which moment um, for create and edit for uh, view only. And this is also for view. So you see the same, I, I call this abused details. It's not, it's not that, that bad at first, but it's, starts to be very strange when, um, you see what I mean? You will never send from the browser to the backend the created app field. That only moves from backend to frontend. So that, that's a one way from backend to frontend. ID also comes from the backend only, and it's always null when you create it, right? So this can grow a bit strange. Uh, let's say name, address, phone, and then created that, and it can become weird at some point. String created by. These two will only be set for the view. These are set and received, create and edit. And this only for, for view. When this comes, it, you, you should consider create, uh, cracking the customer DTO into pieces and having a create customer DTO and a view customer and, uh, I don't know, an uh, uh, update customer. It's a bit painful indeed. Uh, it's a, it's a trade-off. You do duplicate some fields. You do duplicate some mapping indeed. But having a DTO from uh, out of which three fields are sometimes null can be confusing also. Depending on the case, it can get very nasty, this problem. So consider creating such things when the absent fields become confusing. I hope this answers that point. If not, ask again. There will be a section at the end in which you can actually unmute and we can chat. Okay, so data structures. Now, logic. Where do we put the logic? Now, this is a rare painting of you watching the code base of your application. If you don't do anything again, anything, anything proactive, this is how your, uh, the logic of your application will end up. So what we do since the dark ages, we we break the logic into layers, of course, right? And we've all heard, we all have controllers, services, and repositories, right? That's 99% or 95% of applications have such 
in Java have such layers. Right? The rule about layers is very interesting. You will see in a second. Uh, however, 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 sometimes splitting the logic into layers is not enough. Sometimes the domain, the service layer, grows so complex that it needs breaking down even further into what we call subdomains or bounded contexts, if you like. Now, this is a symptom of a monolith that grew big. It's like a project that started 10 years ago and it kept building it, building it with a team of 20 developers. And now it reached, I don't know, 500,000 lines of code. And it's definitely, uh, it should definitely be broken down into smaller modules or microservices if you want. But it, it, it's, it contains so much business logic that um, layering is not enough. You need vertical slicing too. Hmm? I'm not sure if you can get that deep today, but let's see. Layers, however, are very, very uh, easy to understand. And something also happens in uh, fun. Uh, when the service layer grows big, before it gets growing that big as to the require uh, vertical slicing, when the service layer grows big, and I bet half of your applications are that complex, you need another layer. And this is how we, we introduce the application service or the facade, as I call it. Now, uh, let me be very clear. If your application is medium, small, small, I don't know, one, two years of development, three developers, you could get along very well with just these three layers. But the moment the service grows very complex, you need an extra layer, a facade or an application service if you are a fan of a domain-driven ideology. Now, the layered architectural idea in itself says that the layers can only call down. You are never allowed to call back from the repository into a domain service, like I've seen in uh, some, some, some projects do. You are never allowed to have a repository called upwards in an upper layer. Right? So whenever that happens, and it could happen, you need to pull the logic from the repository up so that the repository becomes a one-way uh, uh, one layer. You go through it and you get to the database, nothing else. You don't ever go up or sideways. The repository should be dumb, okay? Any kind of logic should be pulled up. All right, now, we also have this uh, variant, a uh, weaker form of layer, which is called relaxed layer, layered architecture. I'm a fan of this. Um, relaxed layer architecture allows skipping layer. So you will see me going from the facade straight into the repository without any problems, skipping the domain service. Some architects will not agree with this, but if, if, if you, uh, uh, you are careful, this, this, uh, what's the alternative? If you are mandated to go through a domain service to get to the repository, then uh, stupid methods will appear in the domain service, just forwarding your calls down. Imagine the following use case, get user by ID. Okay, how complex do you think this is? Huh? The controller calls the facade, the facade, what? If I go through domain, it's just one extra stupid method in place. So I will skip it. What are some good patterns to differentiate a facade from a domain service? Good question. That's a very good question. Even for do from domain-driven books, don't leave it very clear. And I will, sh and I will, I will share with you my approach. It's not a standard one that you can read in domain-driven books, but it works. It works for seven, pro six projects that I've, I've implemented this way. Now, the facade to keep it to start slow. The facade is an application of separation by layers of abstraction. It's actually something which orchestrates the work of domain services. Now, to, 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 have, to have this very clear from, from, the, from the start, a facade will call into different domain services, right? It's an orchestrator. That's its fundamental role, okay? So uh, uh, the purpose, the, the goal, the reason, uh, the raison d'etre for a facade is to simplify the bird eye view, the, the, the main picture. When you open a facade of a use case, it's clear from in three seconds what goes on inside. Right? Any kind of more complicated things is pushed down into the domain services. That's one way to look at it. But it's not enough. It's not enough to tell you that facades are just orchestrating domain services. 
it's not a practical way to put him to put in action. It's not enough. Now, <laughs> before we continue, I must uh, insist on something. Code, you, we all know that code is not like building layers after layers co uh, progressively. Code is more like a of a garden, like an organic structure that needs continuous care and trimming and conti it continuously evolves. Code is never static. Code always needs to be refactored. That's what I'm talking about, refactored. Now, here comes logic. Here comes requirements, right? Um, requirements come to us. And the first, the default place to put our requirements is a service. I actually had today a call with one of my clients telling me that they have a design pattern around this, telling that any kind of requirement should be represented by a special service class with the name reflecting the name of the requirement. I was like, what are you talking about? They aligned the code so good to the requirement that they had one service class per each specification file. I was like, what the? Anyway, it's a default for most of us. We put logic inside the service. Now, at some point in your career, you will get, uh, you will run on, onto this ideology of domain-driven design. I won't advise you read the blue book. I would advise you start with the red book, Implementing Domain-Driven Design by Vogue Vernon. It's a wonderful book that can change your way, the way you look at the design. If you ask me what's the best design book out there, I will point you to this book. So... Um, read this and then <laughs> read it twice, <laughs> if possible. Uh, read it with someone. Read it in a company, in a brown bag session. Uh, debate on every chapter. It's very, very full of interesting things. And if you want more theoretical stuff, go to the blue book. Hmm? Writing unit tests for a facade. Ha, ha, ha. Let's see, let's see. Wait, wait. Very good question, Vishnu. Very good question. Uh, can you? Ah, okay. I will put it here. Writing unit test for a facade, very cool stuff. Now, a facade, a facade doesn't contain a facade, uh, should not uh, uh, have a high cyclomatic complexity, uh, should require a low number of tests per public method. Now, why, why do I say this? Because when you are testing a facade, I will ideally you should not use mocks because you should only go through your flows several times for each public method, one or two times. Ideally, testing the facade should be a end-to-endish kind of test from the entry point of the use case, completely running with an in-memory or test container database, a I don't know, maybe a mocked um, message. A queue and the wire mock next to it, but no mockito around, just real stuff, ideally, because they have a low number of tests required per flow. Let's see, uh, the, if you would put mockito mocks in place, you will have a huge number of mockito mocks, and you've been there, I see. Right? And it's not really much to test in a facade. So, ideally, I would, like, I would like you to start testing your use cases from a facade down to the repository, everything, with a Spring Boot test with in-memory everything. Hmm? I know uh, you are there because you are like most developers I see today, uh, surrounding every class they test by mocking all the dependencies. That's not what the default should be. On the facade, I will try to test everything, like an acceptance test, if you want like a feature file. If possible, actually use Cucumber and put an acceptance test in front of the business and they approve, ideally. So application services or facades in a perfect world would be tested using features validated and signed by the domain experts. I'm dreaming, Eman. Good question, tricky question. Many people, uh, many people uh, are stuck in here. Very, it's, so the domain services that I see that you, you saw the picture. The facade just orchestrates, and anything complex is done in the domain services. Domain services, testing those, okay, hell yeah, use mocks. Because there are a lot of combinations. But the main flow should be several variations, not much. Anything more complex, you pull out of the facade. Let's see how this plays next. So the services over there will still 
contain the logic. But after you've read some of these books, you will be very tempted to push harder and harder to get more logic inside the domain entities of your of your application, inside methods of your. Um, I'm planning to this year. I hope to do a domain-driven design training. Uh, open publicly for anyone joining. Um, on my website, there is a, a list or you can subscribe and you can get notified when I will publish it. If you are interested, email me and I'll put it in there. The point is, logic, services, and it. But then come the, the, the facades, right? The facades. Where do these fit? And how do you put them in play? Now, what do I do? Uh, technically, many teams struggle with this decision. What should I put in an application service? What should I put in a domain service? How do I decide? Now, there are roughly two main uh, strategies. One strategy is to create one facade per each use case. So you have a get order by ID service, right? like application service. Get order by the application service, which leads to extremely tiny classes for some cases. Here we go. Get, can you imagine how big this is? Get order by the, what the heck, it's three lines of code, what? A class of three lines of code? I was, I was, like, I was like, what? Really? And how many classes do you have? And the guy was scrolling the packages. Oh, let me show you, you have many classes. And I hate it. I hate it. And it, guess what? It doesn't protect you that much. Because then, right next to get order by ID, three lines of useful code inside, right next to it, there was another class named place order service with 2,000 lines of code. 2,000 lines of code in a class. Of course, it's place order, right? So just by putting this rule that every use case has its own class is not enough, leads to two tiny classes, and doesn't protect you against God classes like this. So it's not enough just to impose these rules to a team. Not enough. What do I do? I don't impose this rule. I would allow you to put more use cases in the same facade, even with the price that that facade becomes coupled to more domain services. OK, but. Every time the, uh, the, the risk is still that the order facade grows into an unmaintainable mess. But the point is the following. Every time a use case in here grows, every time the complexity for such a method exceeds, I don't know, 15, 10 lines of code, three ifs out, out extracted in a domain service. And that's how I do it. I pour all my logic inside my facade. If there is some immediate piece of logic that I can push inside the entities, which belongs to the ubiquitous language, to the, to the domain world, like, I don't know, check validity, uh, uh, recode customer, stuff which belongs to the domain, I will try to put it inside the entities as much as I can. There are limitations there too also. So the majority of the logic in most systems still ends in the facade. But then from the facade, whenever something grows big, you extract it into a service continuously, continuously, continuously. So how does it feel? This is the facade. Okay, let's put everything in place. This is the facade that talks in terms of DTOs uh, through the REST API of your application, receives and sends back DTOs over uh, as JSON, for example, right? And as I said, I will implement everything I, I have to do for a use case in a facade. If the use case is super trivial, like get order by ID, that results in a single method inside of the facade. Game over, case closed, done, okay? But <laughs> if we are talking about place order, <laughs> place order. <laughs> 25,000 lines of code I saw in one of my clients. Okay, not in a single method or a class, different. In total, <laughs> oh my God. if we're talking about place order, okay, oh, let's wait a second. Let's extract and extract and extract. Transactions begin. Very cool question, Damian, right on the spot. Most teams start transactions in the facade. If you don't have uh, high requirements about supporting 10,000 requests per second or something like that, if you don't have to do a huge load, starting transactions from the facade onwards, it's enough. 
But for performance, you might want to, to reduce the scope of your transactions, right? For performance, you might want to reduce the scope of the transactions. I explained this. I, you can actually, you can measure this by looking at the collection acquired time. I actually demo this in my performance training if you are interested. I think I have a recording about this also, performance. I, I, I'm on Teachable. Anyway, now, if a use case grows complex, I'm not sure about recording, ask the organizers. <laughs> for my side, why not? Uh, at least for you, for sure. Um, facade, calling, uh, whenever a use case grows big, I will extract it. You, you expected this, right? But when I, ex when I extract it, Something magical happens. I cross a boundary. Be, pay attention here. I cross a boundary. I cross the boundary from the facade into the domain. I enter the holy ground of the domain. When I enter the domain, that's a different module, right? Um, let me quickly, quickly. Can I, can I demo this in, in, in 30 seconds? Let's see. Uh, clean architecture, clean, 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 clean architecture. The, I have two modules in place. One is the application, and the other one is the domain. Clean application and domain. And the moment I call from the facade into the domain, I cross a boundary. Let me show you just this jump. Customer facade. When I call into the, let's see if this is the solved one quotation service. I think that should be enough here. When I, when, I, when I say quotation service, which, which is a domain service, dot recode customer, this baby over here belongs in a different module. It's in the quotation service, which is in the, uh, where are you, quotation service? This is not yet refactored. This from here is not the, not the solved version. This is moved in the domain. And it, you can already see the point. I am moving the domain services into a different Maven module. What's the magic? Whenever I get inside that domain, I can never see anything from the outside world. Right? For the curious among you, uh, I will share with you the Git location for this. You can inspect it yourself. You can look at the Git branches and see what I did for different groups. Um, still waiting for it. But the point is, when I move from the facade into the domain service, it's a different Maven module. Magically, anything outside remains invisible unaccessible from where I go. Hmm? What if you have multiple entry points into the application, REST events, REST and events, for example, events like messages on queues. How would you change the application architecture? Well, technically speaking, events will also go through a message listener, which is in, in right here next to my controllers. I didn't draw it there, but there, is, there are controllers in, into here, controllers. And that controller could call into the facade. Most of the time, if you are designing a very, very purist, a very purist aggregate and event style of code, that's a different kind of architecture. But if you are just talking about some messages on some queues that you need to process, then a message listener can go here and call into the facade or into the domain service. The, uh, what I said remains true. The message structure from outside never penetrates your domain. The same idea. Your logic is built on the structures of your own. The message structures or, or the DTOs are not yours, are external. So you can't rely on them, are part of your API. You don't have freedom to change them. So the domain services that I will have will only take and return objects which are part of my domain, which is super important. Let's see if I can briefly show you what I meant. There are the Git coordinates, if you're curious. All right. And I think that is solved. Not entirely 100% sure, but uh, service, register customer service. Yeah, it's solved. Register customer service is here. Doesn't have, it's not, it doesn't have access to the DTO, you see? The DTO remained outside in the application that we came from. It's invisible over here. So the moment I cross this boundary, I have the guarantee that I only depend on my entity model, nothing else. And that's super important because anything complex will be drawn into the domain. So automatically I will make sure by Maven compilation that I only rely on entities in my inside application, my, in my application. 
um, one trick, one more trick. Can we imagine how big the order domain service can grow? Order service. Can you see it being 10,000 lines of code? Yeah. Order service. Anything can have could have to do with order, right? So what do I advise you to do? If the order, it's a very large central entity with 20, 30 fields, complex stuff, never create an order, never put the name of the of a, of a core entity, large entity, and then service. It's very risky. Try to specialize those services to be more fine-grained, more cohesive. It's very risky to name. I want to do this kind of stuff for any entity. If I have a user entity, okay, user service, what the hell? But Order, if I, if I know I will be working with orders for a long, for many use cases, oh my God, that's very risky. Okay, <clears throat> so what does the facade do? Converts DTOs to entities, to and from. Hmm? Uh, auto mappers, uh, different, different styles. Validation is also here, maybe even earlier if you can, with uh, at valid or not null, hmm? or plain ifs. I don't, I, I don't judge. Just do the validation before you enter the domain. That's for sure. Transactions, as you asked, right? except for high transaction per uh, high request per second systems. And uh, in general, the facade remains an orchestrator, the coordinator of the work. The, its purpose is to get you a clear picture about what are the steps, the main idea, the main points, parts of your of your of that use case. <laughs> Dependency inversion. Not sure if I want to do this with you. Let me check. Yeah, I need to. Because it's all it all connects. Dependency inversion. Dependency inversion. Uh, uh, if you'd never heard of this, <laughs> then yeah, you have a big problem. Because uh, um, uh, if you go to an interview, if you, and you have more than three years of experience, you could expect questions like, define the solid principles. And guess what? D from solid principles is dependency inversion. Version, not ejection, pay attention. Now, let me get you there, slowly. Domain service at some point will have to call some external service, some other microservice, some other service out there. But that call itself um, puts your domain service, which is very, very precious, which is uh, very, very precious. <laughs> puts your domain service in contact with DTOs that come from outside. And this, that's a risk because you might end up building logic on DTOs that are not yours. So what do you do? Those DTOs that you are given, um, working with them will pollute your domain service, will force you to convert, to parse, to, ch to handle checked exceptions, blah, all kinds of weird things that you don't want to, uh, to do. So the first thing you want every time is to take that integration logic out of that domain service. Damian uh, acknowledges that very often in reality, if you enter a use case, you don't have the, 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 the big picture of what goes on. You, this is how it feels in most systems. You dig, you dig, and then you realize something super critical happens three layers deep and that you didn't suspect. Those critical steps should be, especially side effects and mutations, these should be at the top, visible, because that's where the bugs and problems are, changes to data and calls to the external system. They should be in plain sight. So I was talking about calling a service, and that service giving you some shit, <coughs> sorry, some DTO that you don't want to work with. So instead of calling it, how to find good names for facades, oh la la. That is, I will usually start with naming facades by the entity they, they work most on. At some point, it doesn't work anymore. After several years, I would say. Um, so start with the default of grouping the, uh, the behavior that has to do with some core concept under like know, customer, customer facade. If you keep the method small, five, 10 lines, then you could put, I don't know, 20, 30 use cases in the same facade. If you have more than 30 use cases related to customer, <laughs> what the hell are you building? <laughs> you might be 
better thinking about extracting the customer completely out in the customer microservice. It's too big. So if the facade is not enough to put all the use cases, something is fishy. You are growing uh, maybe into a too large monolith. I'm not sure. I need to see examples. It, it doesn't. It didn't, didn't happen to me much. I we were close to that, but never. We, we did have the facade that approached 300 lines, which is too much. But that was the end. The project stopped. Never. Nothing was developed anymore. It's. We were on the verge, very close. So I don't have a good answer to that question. <laughs> depends. It depends. Well. The domain was calling the outside garbage, uh, service. Uh, so instead of, but keep shooting questions, folks, as I told you, uh, this is the main purpose, right? What are, whatever concerns of what we discussed, I'm not keen on finishing everything. We will be about 10 minutes past the hour, so probably, but not, no, we can leave. I, I understood the recording will be shared, yes. Thank you. Now. What we what I just did, I took the part, the garbage part, into uh, the, the integration logic in from the domain service and pulled it out in what we call up, 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 what happened? In an adapter. Wait a second. Let me play this easily. In an adapter, in a design pattern aimed to shield our domain from anything external. Now, this adapter, of course, shouldn't be part of the domain, it should be part of the infrastructure. But if you do that, if your domain service calls into the adapter, if the domain service needs to call the adapter, something weird happens. You need to import the adapter. And the moment you import this module, you import and you see also this. And this is bad. You don't want to give access to these details to enter your domain. You want to keep your domain uh, compilation, let's say, uh, uh, independent of anything external. If you can use compilation for that, why not? So what do we do? From the adapter, uh, who knows what, what, what happens now? Come on, you, I expect many of you know what happens. What should I do to apply dependency inversion to this picture over here? What, do I, what am I missing? What should I do? How can I make sure Exactly, you create an interface. You extract an interface from the adapter and you pull the interface into the domain. Very good. The interface in the domain, by definition, would have to uh, tell the story to be expressed in the, end, in, the, in the domain objects or primitives from my domain. And then something magic just happened. The dependency got inverted. Let me play that again for you. The moment I extracted the interface, look what happened with the, with, with the, with the, the arrow. In, it gets inverted. Why? Because now I have the adapter that has to know what interface it implements, not the other way around. This is dependency inversion. Why is it inversion? Because at runtime, I can still call the adapter. Okay, Spring or EGB or whatever, Juice, wouldn't have any problem injecting here the only implementation I have for this interface. This is not a challenge for any dependency injection framework. So what happens? At runtime, I am given this in this class, but at compilation, I don't see the code that I actually end up calling. That's dependency inversion. I inverted the code dependency. I know, I know. <laughs> I know. It's uh, to fit the slide. It's not a Java standard, but honestly, C sharp Java. Does it matter much? Uh, you may say that uh, I am exposing too much of the implementation. But naming, I'm not following Java conventions. Ah, no. I do use I in my productions. <laughs> uh, uh, but again, this is the kind of stuff that if anyone raises, I will say, okay, we'll do it like you. <laughs> no problem. Right. Good. Uh, so this is a dependency inversion from the, from from the solid principle, right? Is it to do a picture? Yeah, <laughs> is it to do a picture? No, really, it's not that easy in practice unless you have some monolithic system already in place. But the struggle, <laughs> yeah, I like I like Jaroslav. love. Easy to do a picture? Yeah, just to invert the arrow. Actually, it took me thirty minutes to do this animation. But yeah, easy to do a picture uh, on anime. This baby over here, actually extracting the interface from a very deep, complex integration can take you months, weeks at least. 
trying to delineate what the hell am I using from them or what should I map, what should I... So all of these can, um, <laughs> can burn your brain. It's not easy. It's not easy. I agree. I agree. So uh, dependency inversion principle uh, by the book says that abstractions should not depend on details. But if I would tell you that, you would say, what the hell are you talking about? I'm, telling about, I'm talking about the domain, which is something we want to keep in a very friendly environment, in a very controlled environment. Uh, the highest level policy, the domain service, the most critical and complex parts of your logic, that part should not depend on integration details. Uh, and you can use this trick over here to make it sure, make sure that nothing from the lower level, from the infrastructure, penetrates your domain. Mm -hmm. Now, the same technique is usable any way you integrate with other systems. Sending messages in queues, writing files on a network share, database links, who, who uses those. Anyway, any way you integrate, uh, the same technique you can apply to make sure your domain remains agnostic. Ah, cool. And this is using the compiler. But here's one trick for you. You can use static code analysis tools to do the same thing. What are you talking about? What are these? Can you imagine a G-unit test running on Jenkins, which checks that anything from service does not depend, no classes should depend on classes from infrastructure, and this? We'll fail on Jenkins. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll just fail the build. Oh, yeah. Because you called something from infrastructure from the service level. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, some architects will say that this is not strong enough, that they want the code not to compile. Mm, I would tend to agree. But if you have a small system, consider this instead of three Maven modules or whatever. Huh? This pattern can be abused, isn't it? I've been in classes where the class depended on 20 interfaces. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It can be abused. It can be abused. If it doesn't pay to decouple you from something, think twice. Now, I seriously doubt that that class of yours was calling 20 systems. I think that someone was just overly enthusiastic and said, and said, okay, let's have this class not know anything about each other. <laughs> let's put interfaces everywhere. That's like, smells like the 2000s, right? That application should be, I don't know, 15, 12 years old. Uh, um, code is more pragmatic today, okay? Um, although there are good reasons for doing that kind of stuff. Today, when we approach such code, we say microservices, break it in separate systems. Right? So, uh, probably break it into smaller parts. Anyway, you can use this also yourself if you want. If you, if you want to avoid having 20 or 30 Maven modules, I've seen this. I've seen a project with 30 Maven modules and I asked why, and they said decoupling. My God, but couldn't you find a better way? 60% of their time, they were scrolling to projects to find their classes. Where was that thing? I can't remember the name. Let me find it. How do you find it? So, mm, mm, not, not convinced. So, that's arc unit. It's a dependency you can put. Uh, it will just fail the build if you cross uh, a line in an incorrect direction. Good. So, what do, what do we all get to? What do we, what, where do we get to? We want to build a domain, which is independent of externals, we call this agnostic domain, that lets you focus on your problem, okay? Cleans the environment in which you build your complexity. That's the whole, that's the whole point. Right? This domain, let's put all the pieces together. We have external APIs that we call, that throw <laughs> chickens, that throws DTOs at us. Right? We put here an adapter, an interface. We use dependency inversion in here to uh, shield us from that, those DTOs. We have DTOs coming from, your, from our clients, okay? maybe front-end or another service, another application, calling us. These DTOs are converted into here, into the facade, and then passed into the domain. As you can see, the DTOs are kept outside of the domain. If you follow the direction of the arrows, you will see that these arrows only go inwards, which means the domain doesn't know anything about anything outside. And that's the goal, to have the most complex part of your logic written on your own data structures. It's super important to have supporting objects. I've seen cases in which they were operating 
on the deals that they could not change because they were generated. And they were building utility classes and they were helpers and they were subclassing the DTOs. Like, what the hell is that? Just to put a grain of object orientation in there because it was just procedural Pascal style code. Uh, you want this drip of object orientation in the complex parts of your system. So you want to be able to put logic inside. Remember the, the benefit, right? Smaller objects, deeper, richer model, or behavior inside, always valid. These kind of stuff you want from your objects inside. Hmm? All right. Now, database. <laughs> Five more, more minutes, folks. Sorry for keeping you a bit more. Database. Ooh la la. Database. Is it a friend or an enemy? Easier, that's a typical question I ask. No one understands the question at first. What are you talking about? Is, is your database a friend or an enemy? What do you mean a friend? What would be a friend? A friendly database is one that you can control, that you are in charge of. Right? Most Greenfield projects have a friendly database. But where can the database be an enemy? If you inherit a legacy database with uh, 90, 9, 900 tables, like, like a huge schema, like 15 years old, that kind of database is not friendly. Right? Now, depending on how you position yourself, you might want to use the same idea of dependency inversion so that you shield your beautiful entities from the persistence of them. But that's tricky because it's, comp it's pretty much uh, very different from what happens over here between these entities and these DTOs. Entities from here and persistence objects from here, it's, they are much more, much, much more many, how do you call it? Much more numerous, many more than uh, the DTOs coming from outside. You persist and you retrieve from database everything technically. So to create a separate persistence model in the repository, Dependency inverted like this, it's hell for most teams. Means creating, what, we have 100 entities, 100 more classes, plus the mapping, plus the, my God, we were already doing mapping over here, wondering. Some of you asked, what do you do if the entities are very like uh, DTOs? And I would say, yeah, mappers, but maybe don't use auto mappers. Now I'm talking about one more mapping to do for every single use case. That's big. That calls a lot of frustration in the teams that I see. However, this is known to be the onion architecture, all right? The onion architecture. If you Google it, if you, if you search it, this is what you will find. Now, let me be more pragmatic, right? Remember the name of the talk? Clean, pragmatic. Pragmatic. Now, I will consider this to be an enemy in most teams. I've explained where it's not. But if it's a friendly database, if I can change the schema to my will, then I will design my entities and then uh, map it using Hibernate on the, on the database. And just to maybe learning a bit more Hibernate, I will make sure that the entities remain clean and the schema is pretty, pretty well normalized. Now, I have a talk about this uh, on my channel, how you do the tricks that most people don't know about modeling a smart and rich and clean entity model with Hibernate. It is possible. No? Repositories, I don't need repositories outside of my domain. I will use the Spring data repositories, right? Which are, are very polite to us because they talk in terms of our domain. So done, this is out, right? Then I will do one more thing. I will merge the uh, part um, before my domain with the part that, that is invoked by my domain in a single module, call it application. And this is what I refer to to be the pragmatic onion architecture. It's a pragmatic onion, you see? Now, Basically, garbage, <laughs> uh, and this is peace, harmony, yin and yang. Uh, this is Zen in the center. So this is this is why that's why you saw me here with two major modules: an application which depends on the domain, and the domain which depends only on what, only on uh, Hibernate probably. Yes, Hibernate Spring validation, and of course Lombok. Uh, this is love. Anyway, so that's it. That's the only dependencies of my domain is this. So the point is that in the end, you have a domain which still is independent of anything outside. I will skip this topic for a moment. Just a quick round trip of what is commonly understood to be the clean architecture. Oh, by the way, it has different names. Hexagonal, 
port cell adapters, and of course, Uncle Bob called it clean architecture. And you might be aware about this. This is probably one of the most influential articles in the computer science in, about design, the clean architecture. Um, however, this article did also very much harm because it is uberly gener superly generic. Now, what are the main characteristics of um, of, a, of a clean architecture? Quickly, uh, going through them. Your domain logic should not be concerned about user interface, of course. <laughs> there, some of you are still mixing swing with business rules, of course. You should not uh, screen logic here, domain logic here. Huh? You should not mix project uh, procedures in the database. You should not implement domain logic inside PLSQL or procedures, which are not testable, not maintainable. That's why they died. Yeah, put everything in Java. Database, database is, a, is a detail. Database is a detail, okay? And indeed, think about your entity model as if the database is not there, okay? And it's, it's of course, map it wisely to the database, but ideally, you should model your world in, in, in an object model first. You should not be um, concerned of external APIs. You should, shield, you should shield your domain against them. And I showed you how with dependency inversion. Testable. The domain, the center, should be testable without needing to raise the, the world, dockers and systems and contractors. No, it should be tested in isolation super fast, 1,000 tests per second, like the speed. Mokito, of course. You can't do faster than that. And the one, the one point in the Uncle Bob's article, which made many teams do over engineering, was, he said, uh, independent of intrusive frameworks, to quote him. But then the question is, is Hibernate intrusive? <laughs> I don't know. Is an object-oriented mapper, object-relational, is it, is it intrusive? My opinion is not. And I'm supporting this with this link, and I will share the slides with the organizers, and uh, they will get to you with all the links. Good. So that's it. Um, just let me see. Uh, key points. Key points. <laughs> DTOs are evil. <laughs> DTOs are evil because you don't control them, right? They are flat, larger than you need them, different representation of the world, no constraints, setters. Ah, ah. You want a rich domain model that helps you, in which you can uh, you, uh, that you can spice up with constraints or logic, object-oriented programming, for Christ's sake. Uh, then it, the other key point was to protect the core protect the place in which you build the most complex rules right? um, using dependency inversion principle, or remember, remember that, that, that library, ArcUnit, that can fail the build if the test. And then again, very important still, when you design your entity model, you should not be influenced by how you persist the stuff. Right? So you should know that much Hibernate that you know how you will map, but don't think about mapping just yet, right? Could you comment on where Juke places itself? Ha! Juke is a query, right? It is a technique to run queries on the database. It's a fluent language to run queries. Now, would uh, will Juke shield you from using... I mean, what do you think? Does Juke require you to create a different set of objects? I know you can query from the you can query inside the DTOs, you can return DTOs directly from the queries. But it can you can also return entities, right? So do you think when using Juke you need that, uh, the implementation of the repository to, to be outside of your domain? I think that's what I saw most. The implementation of the repository which uses the Juke language, the Juke uh, Fluent language, is kept outside of the domain. But the interface of the repository is implemented, is, stays in the domain. Sure, we, can, we can take this outside, <laughs> we can debate this further. I'm really curious about what you think. So if you can share, I will also. Juke is another tool to database, yes. Uh, but it can still use the entities that you have. So it doesn't force you into creating a different, right? It doesn't force you into creating a different entity set, a different 
persistent object set. <sighs> okay. I must confess my main experience is Hibernate. So yeah, the output of Juke can be mapped to object in entities, exactly. So your repository implementation, which stays outside of the domain, would return instances of your entities. That's what I meant, yes. Then another key point, continuously refactor. Thank you for the question. <laughs> I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the question. So continuously refactor your uh, your code base. Uh, I, you saw, you, I explained how I refactor the facade to extract domain services, uh, continuously massage, extract uh, value objects from, from entities, make your entities shorter by creating deeper, richer model. Right? And read that red book from Vogue Vernon, really changed the mind of many developers. The entire team should understand the design goals. So be wary about this because I've seen teams. I've seen teams. Where are you? I, went, I had a very beautiful. I've seen teams. <laughs> this is not the way to go. Uh, OK, you might have understood everything we discussed today. You might have agreed with a lot of stuff that I said. Don't just try to impose it on teams, on, on, on your colleagues. Explain, debate everything that I, that I, that I explained here. Uh, debate it with your colleagues, argue with, with each other, come reach a common understanding, right? Be very careful. Architecture is a social thing. It's not a cold document that you need to follow. It's a understanding of, it's a collaborative understanding. And uh, very, very, very important, be pragmatic. Never take an article from the internet, say, okay, uh, well, we've we found this, the, the source of truth, let's follow blindly. Never do that. Always go with, uh, put it through your filter, bring some hardcore seniors into the discussion, ask them what they think, do a debate, a brown bag session Friday evening. Good good homework for you. Take this article. I will paste the link in the in the chat. Very, very good article, I must confess. Uh, discuss this article with your with your with your team. And uh, next Friday, meet up with them and uh, ask them what do they think? Hmm? And have everyone have an opinion. Everything looks very good in theory. Do you perhaps have an example of a public repository with clean programmatic architecture? Interesting. That's the same, uh, Patrick. This, uh, I got this question a lot about domain driven. Can you give us an example of a good domain driven architecture, arch archetype, and stuff? And I would say, there isn't. <laughs> and I said, like, why? You see, architecture um, only makes sense. How, how to put this? Ah, it's tricky. Okay, I, I shared with you. Did I share with you the the Git location that I, I had for, with my with my stuff? That is what I what I didn't. This over here is what I use to support my discussions with the team that I teach. But do not take it like that for granted. Why? If your application is very simple, what you see over here is over engineering. If your application is much larger, this is too less to, to few engineering. It's missing some abstractions layers and stuff. So uh, a good architecture is one that suits the problem to solve. So unless you have a complex problem, you can't really reach an, an intelligent architecture. But to explain a complex problem takes two days. So if you want to stay with me two days to, to discuss the problem of uh, shipment across, bound, uh, across international shipping, OK. And then after two days, we can find an architecture that suits that. So uh, OK, we inspire from here, from there. But always think pragmatically about your project. Never take some super architecture from there. Huh? Let's put it, to, let's fit it to now. No, <laughs> never. Um, I would like to help you more with that, but yeah. Hibernate mapping dictates the structure of entity. Does it not? No, it doesn't. You are the master. You create your entities in Hibernate, and then you map it with annotations to some relational database. But it, for a, a brutal example, if you have a customer, is it a good example? Let me insurance entity. Uh, no. If you have, let's expand this. If you have a customer which has a lot of attributes relating address, um, of course, you will keep this address, I don't know, street, silly example, uh, suitable for this hour of the day. Address, street, address, uh, street, number, I think you get the point. Stuff that, is, that would be bundled together. That's it. This would go into the same table, 
but nothing tells you that you should go into the same object. So what you can do over here is to create, and I will invite you to do that, address, which then embeddable. One of the best features that many people don't know, embeddable, uh, embedded here, which technically copies the fields from this object into the table of the customer, bank. So table, 40 columns, Java, 12 fields. Perfect. And there are many more examples like this, like hiding, like dropping bidirectional. What the hell? Let me point you to the what, what I I have this um, channel of mine. Okay. Oops. Ah, come on. Too much that. Too much that. I'm tired. All right. So here is the my channel. And in here, you have somewhere in here. Stuff about designing expressive and performant. This is a trick that I see very few people know in Hibernate that would allow them to build more rich and smart and better uh, entities with Hibernate. So it doesn't dictate the structure. Apparently, you... No, <laughs> it doesn't. Where does stored procedure fit into the architecture we talked about? Nowhere. Death. <laughs> Death to the procedures. No, and let me not be that dramatic. Now, you probably, uh, watching your questions, uh, I expect you are in a large system with a lot of code inherited, and there is a lot of procedures. Now, the procedures in themselves, if you look around, if you ask around, you will see that they are not very much fancy today. Why? Not testable, not refactorable. You can't refactor. You don't have tools to refactor a PLSQL. Right? What not to mention testing. Do you ever have of unit testing for procedures? Although it's technically possible, no one does it. Right? So that's why they die. Now, another problem that I see is the procedures in there replicate logic. Many teams, what, what they do, when they have to change some behavior in a procedure because they can't change the procedure, they replicate the logic in Java and they adjust it in Java, which technically does more harm because now you have two copies of the same kind of logic. You are violating dry principle in a, in a, in a, in a, in a brutal way. So never have logic replicated in the PLSQL Something that is also implemented in Java, never. That's very, <laughs> oops, that's very dangerous, very dangerous. Right? You should migrate. I have many clients which are migrating from PLSQL to Java. It's a piece of art how you do that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, no, let's not be that dramatic. PLSQL, it does have its purpose. Uh, it's, it, the fastest way you can process data. Although with Spring Batch and careful tuning, you can reach considerable, very close performance, right? So if you, nowadays when you have that much data, people choose no SQL, Cassandra, Mongo, something big, <laughs> something big data, right? But if you have legacy systems, where do they fit? They fit here somewhere and what? It's complicated because something that should belong in the domain now is outside. Mm, strange. Try to test them and bring them inside Java. It's it, it, you could take one month for a single procedure of three hundred lines, but I <laughs> that's why it took me. But uh, it's doable if it's in plan. I don't know. What else? What else? Other questions? Other very, very, very wonderful questions. Thank you very much for staying that this late with me today. Uh, relationship relations in persistent subjects. Yes, because you, we probably all have the tendency to create bidirectional dependencies, links everywhere. That's not, watch the video I shared with you, the last one. Uh, this, that's a bad practice. Only unidirectional. Sometimes even with, without any link in GPA. Start procedure are useful when you want to transport the data from the database to the application. Yes, indeed. If you want to, want to, when you want to open it inside the database, nothing is faster than that. I can tell you that. Okay, very good stuff. Other uh, folks, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, I will share the links for this. If you want to to uh, to know more into, I don't know. Explore more about what we discuss here with me. This is what I do for a living. Uh, join my community right now. That's free and fun. And uh, I will tell you a secret. All, all, the, all the stuff that I learn, and I'm, it's not yet stable enough for a, for, a, for a commercial training, I experiment in my community. So 
Why are not a fan of microservices? <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> Did I say that? Poof! <laughs> I can, yeah, I can be burned for this answer. Oh my God, is it recorded? No. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a fan of nano services. Now, uh, nano services meaning uh, five developers developing 10 microservices. What the hell is that? No, I don't like that because it's too much overhead, too much overhead for any human being, too much overhead. DevOps, pipelines, continuous integration, contracts, a lot of overhead for what? So this, no, I am against this. I hate those, officially. Microservices themselves, as long as the team matches a system. So if you have a team with one say, system, if done correctly, they can rock. But... <laughs> What, what, what you say? What, what, we are in our team between what services versus builders. What builders are just a tool to build an object? What a builder should be stripped of any logic. Builders should not. Builders, by the way, breaking news: builders should not be used in production code. Oh my God! What did he say? Why builders should not be used in production code? What? Only in tests. Why do you need builders in production? Ah, uh, tricky discussion. Let me give it a shot. Uh, I have just a diagram. We love diagrams, don't we? They are so sharp and clear. So here's a diagram for you, explaining why builders are a bad practice. <laughs> okay, uh, it's late for this, but let's give it a try. Are your objects mutable? Do you have setters for your object? If you have setters, did you ever consider creating a setter which returns this outside? If you do that, you don't need builders for this class. You can just chain the setters. So if you have setters for an object, you don't need builders. Not in tests, not in production, no. If your objects are immutable, only constructors, then, there is a problem first about optional fields, fields which are not required. If they are not required, they don't come to the constructor, but they have withers to give them optionally if you need to give them. Notice how this wither returns a, new, a copy of object with the optional field set in place. Now, the mandatory fields, they all go to the constructor. Perfect, and they are validated over there, perfect. Now, how many constructor arguments do we have? How many, how large objects, how large immutable objects do we have? Now, if these are small, you don't need builders. Again, you just can call the constructor. My object, X, Y, Z, that's it. The only problem in which you really apparently need builders is when you have large immutable objects, which, is a code smell. I'm sorry to say that. Large, immutable. What do I mean by large? I don't know. Five fields? Seven? Anything above seven fields? It's too large for an, for an immutable object. So there you go. Indeed, when you have a large immutable object, you need builders to hide the constructor. That, that now takes nine arguments, nine required fields. X, Y, Z, T, U, W, <laughs> right? Now, the real, so the better solution than a builder is to break down the immutable data model even more. Break it down. That's what many people don't see. And it's hard. It's hard. Ho, ho, ho. An immutable object cannot be, cannot be as big, as many fields as, a, as, as one that has setters. Never. It must be much more broken down into smaller classes. Always. You can never survive. 12 fields in an immutable object. Good luck with that. So, first thing that many teams don't didn't thought of doing is this, which is very easy. You, know, actually, you can actually tell Lombok to generate these setters for you. The other thing that many people are missing is this, which is hard indeed. Immutable large object needs calls for better broken breaking breakdown of, of, of objects. <laughs> it's late for this shit. <laughs> sorry, man. But uh, Sorry. Um, uh, but services versus builders. 
services contain domain logic, builders, in my opinion, don't have any business in the production code. They are only for testing, technically speaking. And even then, you can get rid of them with, with fluent setters or deeper breaking down of objects. It would require 15 more minutes of playing to see it, but it's all recorded. <laughs> for any kind of questions you have, never hesitate to contact me. If something you don't agree with, maybe a colleague of yours that doesn't agree with something, challenge me back. It's my duty to keep this as sharp and as, as uh, universally acceptable by all developers, right? So, um, right. I think I'm done. Good. <laughs> Thanks. And That's sorry. Very nice talk. Thank oh, you very thank much, you. Victor. Uh, if you have any questions, guys, uh, that's the very last minute <laughs> to, to shoot the question to, to Victor. Uh, we spent 19 minutes with him. Uh, many good questions, so thank you very much. Uh, if you want to shoot a question, just let us know. If not, we'll be finishing. So, Victor, thank you very much for a very deep uh, uh, session. Uh, the recording will be available uh, in, in probably in a couple of days. I will publish uh, if Victor uh, agree on that. Uh, but I heard that he's okay with that, so we'll publish mm -hmm. it. Uh, will it be public for anyone or just for the registered uh, participants? Uh, for for the people from the DevFix. Okay. Uh, I am okay with either way you want. Okay, okay. good. So we, we can we can make it public as well uh, in a couple as of more days yes. or something like that. Uh, Good. I think that mo most uh, uh, people get if they come to the sessions and ask questions during the talk, so if they can. Yeah, learn. I know. I also. Uh, that's why I was looking for questions. Questions. Yes, sure. Right. Thank, you. Thank you for having me this early in the year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the year is packed till end of April, and then it's DevOps. So hopefully, you you will come to DevOps as well. Uh, let's see. That, uh, let's see how things go. The time will be a bit calmer than it is right now, and we can all meet uh, on, at the conferences. So thank you again, and have a great uh, rest of the evening. And thank you guys for joining us as well. Thank you. Have a nice day.